Well, as we've been mentioning, we are going to study the book of Hebrews. So if we would turn to the first chapter of Hebrews, Hebrews in chapter 1. This book could really be called or titled The Preeminence of Jesus Christ. And what that really means is that he is superior to everything and everybody. He is preeminent. I believe and pray that uh, we can benefit from our study in this as we go through this book. It's a difficult book, as I mentioned. There is many deep truths. There are things that are beyond understanding. And apart from a deep knowledge of the Spirit of God and the commitment to understanding the Word of God in total, we, we, we just simply are not going to understand it. If we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit in us, there's just going to be a lot of words here. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can have a great understanding of what is here. And yet, at times, there are just going to simply be times where I'm going to say, you know what, the Bible just says it, so we must simply believe it. We must accept it at its face value. We must not go in there and, and uh, change it into some kind of allegory and say, well, it says this, but it doesn't really mean that. I, I believe in a, in a direct um, interpretation of scriptures. And I believe the Bible says what it says, and it says it for a purpose, and it says it for a reason. And I believe that what it said 2,000 years ago, it still says today. And our Bible specifically tells us that um, God is unchanging. He's not going to change his mind on things. Our world goes through different changes. We live in a different time and day and age than they did 2,000 years ago. There's all kinds of weird and strange things happening today that weren't happening 2,000 years ago. There was weird and strange things happening 2,000 years ago that aren't happening today. But at the same time, there's this thread of Jesus Christ of God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so it applies to us perfectly today. Because in the end, a sin is still a sin. And the way to heaven is one way. And that's what the Bible teaches us. It's what the Bible says. You know, there's certain things in this life that I simply do not understand. I, I can't come to a full comprehension of it. I don't fully understand gravity. <laughs> You know, and, and why is gravity heavier here on the earth than it is on the moon? And, um, you know, why does, you know, our, 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 our moon has such an effect on gravity here on the earth that the tides come and go? And there's all of this fighting going on with all these different things. And I go up in an airplane and my ears pop and I come back down and they go back to the way they were. And, and I don't fully understand it all. I have a general knowledge of it. But what I do know is if I take these flowers here and I drop it, it's going to go down to the ground, right? <laughs> we all know it's going to happen. You might not be able to tell why it's going to happen. You just simply know it's going to happen. And, you know, some people understand cars and why they do what they do. Others are just, you know what, they go out and they turn the key and it starts or it doesn't start. And if it doesn't start, they're, they're at a loss, right? They don't even know what a battery is or where it's at. I, I used to sell Dodge, uh, what were they, the Dodge Stratus. And I would, when people would look at him, I would say, tell me where the battery's at. I open up the hood and say, where's the battery? And you can't find it because it's not underneath the hood. You actually literally had to turn the wheel to the left and go to the driver's side. And there's a little panel there that you had to open up and the battery was inside there. That was a great engineering. Yeah. Don't understand it, but that's what they did. And why they did it, I don't know. I just knew that's where it's at. You know, there's other things. Some people, we use computers, right? We use a cell phone. And while you might know what your car does and how it does it, and you can tear it all apart and rebuild it, that same person has no idea how a cell phone works, right? Why does it work? I don't know. I just turn it on and it works. When I was in college, I have a degree in computer science. I had to learn uh, binary coding. And then I had to learn hexadecimal coding. And binary coding, at least that makes a little bit of sense to me. There's ones and zeros and you know, groups of eights and sixteens or whatever, thirty twos, and you can kind of do something with that. But when you get a hexadecimal, you, you count to ten, and then you go start getting into letters. It's A, B, C, D, E, F, or whatever it is up to, and then you got to multiply them. You got A times five, and this is what it comes out to, and divide it, and all those things. And I, and I had a hard time understanding it. I'm sure a lot of you would too. What I know today is I turn on my computer, and it either turns on or it doesn't. <laughs> and if it doesn't turn on, I could be at a loss, even with some computer background that I have. 
And you all know we had that uh, cyber attack at Rockford Public School and somehow magically everything on my computer disappeared and we never got it back. Someone else has all the information that was on my computer. Someone in Russia. Mm. That's the way some of Hebrews is going to be. Sometimes we're just going to say, I don't fully comprehend it, but I know it's true because the Bible says so. And as we go through here, you'll see there's going to be times where I'm going to say it. We just need to trust God, don't we? Another thing that we're going to do, in order to understand Hebrews, we're going to have to understand some things from the Old Testament. So we are going to reference back to the Old Testament certain things. And in particular, it's going to be the book of Leviticus. I don't know if you've ever tried to read through the Bible. <laughs> and you read Genesis, and, and it just encapsulates you. I mean, you can just read it. You can read the whole thing in one setting. It's all these wonderful stories that you grew up learning. And then you get to Exodus. It'll be a little bit harder to read, right? Still pretty good. You know, not that any parts of the Bible are bad, but it's still stories and different things you can get into. But then you get to Leviticus. <laughs> you can really get bogged down in Leviticus, right? It, it can even get to the point where you start reading and you just go to sleep. There's a lot of rules and regulations and different things for the priests there. In order for us to understand Hebrews, we are going to look a lot into Leviticus, and we're going to be familiarizing ourselves with some of the book. It'll be fun. We're not going to bog ourselves down with some of those things, but we will have to look into it in order to understand Hebrews better. So when we look at Hebrews, a very interesting thing happens. Every book that we read in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, it starts off with, I... Paul, Peter, whoever, or somewhere in there, if we talk about the Gospels, we have a pretty good understanding of who's writing it, don't we? If we are to ask and take a query, who wrote the book of <laughs> Hebrews, we have a problem, don't we? Hebrews does not start off with, I, Paul, I, Peter, I, Apollos, which is how you would start a letter, basically, back in those days. Today, you know, we write a letter, and at the end we say, love, Pastor Matt. <laughs> Hopefully you don't write that down, but that's what I would do. <laughs> Back in those days, you start off with, I, Pastor Matt, then write the letter. You know who it is right away. This letter does not start that way. So there's a lot of argument, there's a lot of discussion about who wrote the book of Hebrews. Some will tell you till they're blue in the face it was Paul. Some will tell you till they're blue in the face it was Peter. And some will tell you till they're blue in the face it was Apollos. So I'm going to tell you who the author is. I'm going to reveal to you right now the author of Hebrews. And you will not be able to argue with it. The author of Hebrews is the Holy Spirit. He authored the whole Bible. As to the avenue that he used, the person that he used to write it down, take your guess. Don't really care all that much. It's not revealed, so we're not going to speculate. They're not going to argue about it. There's no reason to. We all have our ideas. I kind of think I know who probably did it, but... It's not that important. The important part is, the Holy Spirit wrote, wrote it, and we can be 100% positive of it. So who was the book of Hebrews written to? It was written to a suffering, persecuted group of Jews somewhere in the east. Not in Israel. They were outside of Israel. By the way, as you go through the book of Hebrews, there is no reference to the Gentiles. So the problem of Gentiles and Jews living in the same church together and, and the trials and struggles that that worked into the church, it's not there in this church. Do not know the exact location of this group, perhaps Greece, that 
might be about the best uh, spot that people have chosen, but we don't know for certain. This is a Jewish community that had been evangelized by the apostles and the prophets. And unlike many of the other churches and many of the other people that uh, Paul or any of these other uh, people had written to, these uh, letters to, this group of Jews had never met Jesus. Many of the Jews in some of the other churches around, especially in Jerusalem, they had people in the church that had met Jesus. This group did not. So everything that they knew and everything that they had was secondhand knowledge. Guess what we have today? We have a lot of people in churches today, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, most of us are Gentiles. We have never met Jesus, have we? Oh, we've met him, I know him. But he's never you know, like shown himself to me in a dream or like stood in front of me like what Paul had. We have secondhand knowledge. That's what the Word of God is for us. When was this letter written? No one has an exact date, by the way. Can't put an exact date on it. But we can know a couple of things. One, it was after Christ's ascension, which was about 30 A.D., but we also know that it was before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Many people place the timing of the writing of this book between 60 and 65 A.D., but no one can know for certain. In the studies that I did, I believe it's probably more towards the later end, towards 70 A.D., but can't say 100% certain. This group was persecuted, as I mentioned. And in particular, they were persecuted by other Jews. They were persecuted by Gentiles, but more so by other Jews. One of the problems that they had in the church, and we're going to discuss this in great detail as we go through, is that they were having the problem and the danger of turning back to Judaism incorporating the Old Testament into their worship and what they were doing. And so their salvation was really turning into a legalism. And, and, and I'll tell you, and if you can imagine this, we, we have all been raised differently, haven't we? We all have different backgrounds. We all have different things that have happened in our life. A Jew in those days... While they might have different families and they come from different, you know, uh, areas in the city or whatever, they all basically were raised underneath the Old Testament law. And so these people, having all of that in their background, really would have a hard time turning away from that, wouldn't they? And if you can imagine, if you were like me, uh, you know, None of you were raised as a pastor's kid, but you, you probably were or may have been raised in, in a fundamental Bible-believing church. If you were raised that way, it's really hard to get rid of that in your life, isn't it? And, and I think of, in particular, there's a lot of uh, people and, and different uh, uh, groups of people that have been raised Catholic. And whether or not you practice Catholicism, if you come along and say, what are you, what religion are you, they'll say Catholic, right? They haven't been to a Catholic church in 40 years, but they're Catholic. <laughs> and some of the uh, things that the Catholic church then stand for and believe, they stand for and believe it. Because when they were little, their parents were Catholic and they went to Catholic church. Well, that's the same thing with these Jewish people. They were raised, they, they, they went to these synagogues, they did certain things, they, they had all the Old Testament law that they were trying to apply to their life all the time, and now all of a sudden, a new covenant comes along, this new teaching comes along, they have all these new writings, they become believers, true believers, because they say, yes, Jesus was the Messiah, we believe that, but... All of these things in their background 
keep trying to work their way back into the church. And so when someone comes in and says, hey, guess what? You know, yes, Jesus was Christ. Jesus was the Messiah. He did die on the cross for your sins. He did raise from the dead. But you know what? He also wants us to still offer sacrifices. We're going to see that in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews in chapter 6. People were still offering sacrifices. And it was making a mockery of what Christ did on the cross. Christ was the, the final sacrifice. And all of these sacrifices from the Old Testament all pointed towards Christ coming and being that final perfect lamb to, that would pay for all the sins that this world had ever committed. And he did that. Now, from that point on, if you keep offering sacrifices, you know what you're literally saying? Christ was not this final sacrificial lamb. He was not perfect enough. His blood did not pay for my sins. I still must pay for my sins. So all these things and all the Old Testament law was trying to work its way back into this church of Jewish believers. And that causes a problem. It really leads to legalism, doesn't it? So he writes here, and he says, Hang on to the better covenant. You had the Old Testament, you had the Old Covenant, that was for a specific purpose. But now we have a new covenant, and we have Christ. And that little video we watched where it says, Jesus is better, that's what Hebrew says. Jesus is better. It says it over and over and over again. He's better than anything they have. And, and, and that video pointed out, he's better than any person. He's better than any institution. He's better than any ritual. He's better than any sacrifice. He's better than Moses. He's better than Joshua or Aaron or his priesthood. Those people really look back to their Old Testament fathers, didn't they? Father Abraham. I mean, he is a rock to them. And for them to hear, Jesus is better than Abraham, for some of the Jews, that was a real problem. It's not easy for them. They do not want to accept this new covenant completely. They do not want to break from how they were raised and all the traditions that they had. It reminds you back into your childhood, doesn't it? We love some of the things that happened in our childhood. They did too. Now the Gentiles, of course, they didn't have these problems, did they? If you went to a Gentile and you said, here's the truth. Let me tell you the truth. Here's the writings that we have so far. Here's the new covenant. Jesus came in this world. He died on the cross for your sins. There's eternity because of it. A Gentile might sit back and go, hmm. I've never heard such a thing. That's interesting. They weren't looking for the Messiah to come, were they? They weren't looking for the Messiah to set up an earthly kingdom and, and to destroy the, the bad people and, and for Christ to rule and reign for a thousand years. They weren't looking for that. The Jew was. The Gentile wasn't. Why did many Gentiles become believers and the Jews reject? Well, the Jews didn't have this so-called, this truth of the Old Testament that they were leaning upon. They could accept it easier. Now I'll tell you, there was this natural desire for the, the, the Jew to keep the Old Testament law and say, you know what, I already know the truth. I don't need you to tell me that Jesus was the Messiah. I know he wasn't because he didn't do what the Old Testament said he was going to do. He did do what the Old Testament said he was going to do, but they had it wrong in their thinking. So Hebrew tells these Christians to put their confidence in the New Covenant. They're not losing something, which many of them probably thought they were doing, losing something. They're getting something better. They were deprived of an earthly temple. They were getting a heavenly one. They were deprived of an earthly priesthood. They were receiving a heavenly priest. They were deprived of the patterns of the sacrifices they were getting a one final sacrifice. So the word better is all through the book of Hebrews. Everything is new. Everything is better. So let's go to the words in Hebrews now. 
I promised you we would study verse number one and part of verse number two. So it kind of lays down some of the principles of what this group was going through and some of the hardships they were. We'll tell you a little bit more about it in future uh, lessons, if you will. But the author here starts and, and hits right at the subject. Christ is superior to everyone and everything. Verse number one, we're going to see the preparation for Christ. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So there's a lot to unpack even right here in this first sentence. When I read this sentence, the first word that jumped out of the page to me was the word spake. God spoke. That's a tremendous word to me. How would we know anything about God if he didn't speak? You know, there's, I think there's this, and I believe I can prove it through the Bible, when, when God made us in the image of God. In the image of God created he them. Male and female created he they. We're made in the image of God. That doesn't mean I look like God, necessarily. I don't know what God looks like. I'm sure the Bible calls him a spirit, so he doesn't really have a look. But he certainly picked some other look than what I look like. I can be sure of that. When it says that we were made in the image of God, the Bible literally is telling us that we have a spirit. A spirit that's going to go on forever. That's what separates us from the animal kingdom. It does not say that dogs or cats or monkeys or giraffes or whatever are made in the image of God. It says, we are made in the image of God. I have a spirit. And I'll tell you, that spirit is longing to know God. You are a spiritual being. And, quite frankly, it's why the world finds itself spiraling downward in a downward spiral if they don't know the Lord as their Savior, because this spirit wants to know God. I have no doubts about it. And if it doesn't find God and know God, then it, then it fills that void in their life with something else. You know, and it could be anything that people are looking for for happiness. In many cases, it's just drugs and alcohol and different things. They just fill themselves with that and, and they drown out their sorrows because they don't know the power of the Holy Spirit in their life, right? They don't know. And, and, and the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace. Those are first three. That's what the world is looking for. That's what it wants. And it's because of this spirit that they have in them. But when they don't find it, they, they try to fill it with something else. We're made in the Spirit of God. Then... I think a secondary part of being made in the image of God is that man then, if they don't find God, they make up their own religion. And there's all kinds of religions for you to choose from, isn't there? Humanism. And you can go anything from Mormonism, Church of the Latter-day Saints, Seventh-day Adventist, Jehovah's Witnesses, Muslims, Buddhism, ISIS, whatever it is, Islamic State. You can choose from a variety of different gods that you want to choose from that man has come up with. Because we have this spiritual being. Now, if you look at all the other religions in the world, basically, they have a god that needs to be appeased. And if you appease their God, you get to go to heaven. That's the basis of most religions across the world. Which is the total opposite and backwards of what the Bible teaches. This is basically the only religion that would teach that God sent his son not to become some kind of dictator and rule over everybody and be appeased, but God gave himself. And he died on the cross so that we can know salvation. That's an amazing thing. And you, one, would not come up with that theory 
for that scenario. Only God can come up with that. And so it was highly important that God write these things down for us so that we could meet him and know him and know how to go to heaven and accept him as our personal Savior. So when here it says, God spoke, that's a great amen, isn't it? We needed God to speak and introduce himself to us and send his son. So God spoke, and then it uses these two words. It says, in sundry times and in diverse manners. That's pomeros and putropos. In sundry times, that's many portions. What is that in the Old Testament? Because we're talking about the Old Testament here, right? Because he says that unto the fathers by the prophets. So he's talking about the Old Testament. He spoke to them in 39 different books, 39 different ways. 39 different, well, it's not 39 different people, but different people, right? All through the Old Testament. And by the way, how do all these people over the course of thousands of years write the Old Testament and it all perfectly lines up together? Man can't do that, but God can. And then he uses, and then the other word that he uses is diverse manners. That's different manners. Sometimes God spoke directly to a man, sometimes in a vision, sometimes in parables, sometimes in types or symbols. And he did that unto the fathers, so the Old Testament people, spiritual ancestors, and he did it by the prophets. The prophets, the Old Testament prophets, were God's messengers. A prophet is one who speaks to men for God. And so there's all kinds of prophets in the Old Testament. And then he says this, and we'll close with this. Have in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So what did God do? He used sundry times and diverse manners in times past in the Old Testament to the fathers by the prophets, but now in these last days, and that's an interesting phrase because to the Jew, you know, what the old, you know, what these last days would mean the time of his coming, wouldn't it? The Jew would open up his mind and think that way that this is a messianic reference that he was coming to set up his earthly kingdom. So if God came in these last days, if Jesus came in these last days to set up his earthly kingdom, where did it go? What happened to it? Well, the Old Testament prophesies that, doesn't it? They rejected the Messiah, and so God instituted this age of grace that we're in, this church age. He intervened because they rejected Messiah. If the Jews would have accepted Christ as Messiah, would we need this church age? Mm. We wouldn't, would we? This church age is here because the Jews rejected Messiah. <laughs> they missed him. So now we have this church age that we're in. Jesus came, Messiah came, they rejected and the fulfillment of all the promises of the last days had to be postponed. How has he spoken to us in these last days? By his Son. John 4, verse 25 says, The woman saith unto him, this is the woman at the well in Sychar, she said, I know that Messiah cometh, who is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. She knew that when Messiah arrived, he would unfold the full and final revelation of God, and indeed Christ did. But they missed it. So as we continue through this study, and we're going to, we'll pick up next week in, in verse number two. As we continue, we'll see a tremendous outflow of Christ and his superiority and how he is far greater than anything that this world has to offer. And you saw all the things that this world has to offer, right? You can think about all the things that this world has to offer. All kinds of different religions, all kinds of financial gain, all kinds of 
different things that this world goes for and goes to and tries to fill this spiritual void that they have and they just need and need and need and need more and they never find that happiness, they never find that joy, they never find that security that God offers through the power of this Holy Spirit. As we go through here, we're going to see how Christ is superior to it all. And there is a better thing than that one only the Old Testament offers, but what this world has to offer. And we'll continue to speak about that. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for this message you gave to us. I know that as we go through here, there's going to be some difficult things for us to understand. But I pray that as we set up this whole scenario, this, this group of Jewish believers that are just being uh, persecuted, especially by the Jews, but also by the Gentiles, I pray that we can see into their hearts, into their lives, and into their souls, and see the difficulties and trials that they have. And may we be able to apply that to our lives today and just see Christ the way that he is superior to everything. And Father, as we see that, may we just uh, lean upon you and lean upon him to get us through each and every day. Father, now we just ask these things in your name. Amen. We do have a closing song. In your hymnals, it's 293.